Okay. Thank you, David and Donovan. Welcome, everybody. I'm Steve. I'm the pastor here. It's so good to be with you. I've been looking forward to this all week. And uh, especially, see, we're going to be uh, recognizing some of our high school seniors in both services. Today, I see the Stock and Stolp families here for that. So good to be with you. Uh, if you are new here and you kind of like have questions about what's going on or what you can do, I would encourage you after worship, just find anybody with a name tag on and they would be able to help you or point you in the right direction. If you are worshiping with us online, welcome. And uh, I would encourage you, if you're, if you're watching on, you, uh, on our website or on Facebook, there's a comment section and you can uh, ask any questions and there'll be a host online to help you with that. Uh, I would also like to add that the best way to get up-to-date information about whatever's happening at Faith Westwood is through our, month, or our weekly email called Faith Connect. It comes out early on Monday morning. And uh, so if you are interested, if you're not getting it and you're interested, make a note on your connection card and you'll start getting it, uh, maybe not tomorrow, but at least by the next week. And then uh, also, if you're worshiping online, just ask a question about that, uh, and someone will be able to help you with that as well. You know, uh, we're going to be opening our worship today with a hymn that is one of my favorites by Charles Wesley. I have even been known to sing it while I'm alone driving in the car. So let's stand as we sing. Miss Leah here. I'm so glad you could join us today. And remember, no matter where you're joining us from, at home or here in worship, you are exactly where God wants you to be today. I can't be there today, but my friends Pete and Repeat and my friend Brody are there today to tell you more about how we can be better together when we take care of one another. So would you please welcome Pete, Repeat, and Brody.
Hey, what's up? I'm a repeat, and that's Pete over there in the blue shirt, if that didn't give it away with the giant P on it. We, uh, we're really excited about VBS coming up. It's coming up in June 13th through 17th. Uh, it's going to be in the evenings, and sign-ups for your kids and volunteers. There's going to be QR codes. There's a couple over on the Tiki Hut. We put some at both main entrances and then upstairs in the kids' area. So kind of going along with this Better Together thing, um, every year at VBS we pick a child to kind of come along with us and be our VBS kid. And the first year we had, we had Brody. So we're going to have Brody kind of tell you a little bit about his story. All right, hi guys, um, my name is Brody Linnell, and I was uh, the 2018 kind of VBS kid. Um, so I'm just going to tell you guys um, what it meant to be a VBS kid. So when I was born, I was diagnosed with this condition called fibular hemimilia, which means that my left leg grows slower than my right leg. It also means that my left foot has three toes on it. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, but anyway, I had a surgery two years ago in 2018 to help lengthen my left leg to catch up with my right leg. And um, the VBS crew came down and supported me. They drove seven hours all the way down to where my surgery was in St. Louis. And um, they gave me Mo, the mascot for that year's VBS. And most importantly, they prayed for me. Um, they, re they really cared for me. That meant a lot to me and my family because, you know, it, it's nice to be cared for. <laughs> um, I also... It, they also FaceTimed me that during that week's VBS. Um, it, it also happened to be the first week that I was in the hospital, so it was really something to look forward to every day. Um, it, it was so nice to see everyone all out in the pews uh, cheering me on. It was really encouraging me to go forward. Um, and yeah, it was um, also really cool to see them cut one of my shoes in half. It was kind of uh, symbolic of, you know, me moving on and, you know, letting my left leg catch up. Um, yeah, it was just really nice of them to do that. Um, they also hold a, held a silent auction for me, which was really nice. It was a great surprise because it really helped us, um, you know, live in St. Louis for two months. Um, it really helped us like buy food and stuff like that. Um, it really, it was a really pleasant surprise. It meant a lot to us. Um, so yeah, that, that's it. Um, I just wanted to say it meant a lot for you guys to support me like that. Yeah. Thank you. So the following year, we had Mason Prudell. He uh, he needed a heart transplant, and so he. We, we met his, his parents through a foster care thing, and we kind of grew really close to their family, and our, the VBS team decided we were going to kind of bring him as our next VBS kid. Um, we did a penny war for him where the kids donated pennies, and they kind of had a war for him, and they raised some, some money for him and his family, but he kind of gave us a little video, so if you wouldn't mind firing that video, please. Hello, my name is Mason Cabardell. I I'm seven. And I received a heart transplant in five... When I was... Wait. When, when I was... When I was five, and these are my mom, so... Hi, I'm Sam. Hi, guys. And I'm Julie. And this is Mason. Like he said, Mason's seven, and he received a heart transplant when he was five years old on July 7th of 2019. In order to bring Mason home from the hospital after his transplant, we had to do a lot of changes in our household um, just to help keep everything more clean as he was gonna be uh, more immunocompromised and on a lot of different medications. And in order to do that, we had a house full of carpet and we needed to replace that carpeting. And Faith Westwood really helped us when the vacation Bible study took Mason under their wings and helped raise money for our family and to bring Mason home. And it was pretty incredible. It was almost the exact amount that we needed to tear up the main floor, all of the carpet, and to replace it with cortex flooring. So it was really helpful to be able to have uh, VBS help raise money for that so Mason could come home. And Mason came home for a few months, and then he was back in the hospital again. But now he's home and stronger than ever. Right, buddy? Show your muscles. Yeah. Here's your we are just so grateful for everything that you guys did for us. And... Um, we just hope that we keep being safe at home and that you guys all keep being safe out there. 
So thank you again. Thank you for everything that we you so did for us. We so appreciate it. The cards, the videos, all of the things. Even the day Mason got his transplant, uh, we got a big video from everybody cheering him on, and they were really excited. And that was really fun for us moms to see, especially while he was in surgery, too. So it wasn't just about the money that was raised, but that definitely helped us bring Mason home and keep him safe in the house. You want me to say it or yeah, something? Yeah, say thank you. Thank you. For everything. Thanks for everything, and... Um... Have a good summer. Have a good summer. I'm pretty shy. <laughs> Have you. a good summer. So we chose another child to be this year's VBS when he was actually supposed to be last year's, but due to the pandemic, we kind of had to put things on pause. So Henry Malky is going to be our next uh, VBS kid. Um, we were going to have him wheeled down here, but it doesn't look like they made it in time. So uh, if you guys can just kind of say a prayer for him and support him through VBS and through our congregation, that would be fantastic. So as Leah would say, may the Lord bless you and always smile upon you. She said she misses you, she loves you, and we will see you soon. Thank you. Please stand and join me in singing our next hymn. remain standing for the reading of the scripture just kidding you can all be oh, seated my bad. totally fine my bad <laughs> and at this time I will invite um, our seniors and their parents to come forward Larissa and Dave have a small gift to give to the parents first parents get it then the seniors do <laughs> beautiful so just hang out real quick. Perfect. Today, we honor our high school seniors. We honor them today not for any awards they have won or achievements they have earned, but simply because they are gods and part of this faith family. 
as they stand on the threshold of the next phase of their lives, we offer them our blessing and our promise to be here for them as they face the many challenges and changes the many years will come. So parents, I will have you now take, open up the gift and take whatever is in the gift and give it to your senior. So this morning, our seniors are receiving a blanket with their names embroidered on them. As their faith family, we hope that the warmth and comfort of this blanket will remind them of, your, of our love for you and Jesus' constant presence with you. So you can hang on to it or you can wrap it around you for right now, whatever is fine, whatever you, whatever you feel like. And then Dave and Larissa have something for you as well. Seniors, there was a day when those standing with you held you in their arms and rocked you to sleep. They cuddled you in a blanket to keep you warm, safe, and comforted. Very soon, you will be launching a new life, a life away from the safety and security you have known as a child, away from your home, family, church, and community. Parents, please repeat after me this blessing for your student. Say your child's name. You are a blessing to us. You've given our lives a deeper meaning and a deeper calling. Wherever you go, our love goes with you. Whatever you do, you will always be a part of our hearts. We bless you in the name of Christ our Lord. Seniors, please repeat after me the blessing for your parents. Say your parents' names. You've been given, you've given of your heart and home. You loved me and cared for me, even when it was difficult. Thank you for your courage, your patience, your wisdom, and your love. I thank God for the blessing my life, for blessing my life with you. <clears throat> Seniors, may this blanket be a reminder you are no, you are never alone. May it remind you of the warmth, security, and comfort you always have with you through the love of your of God and your, and faith family. Go with the love of your faith family and God's blessing. You know, uh, Rafe and Colton, when you talked about being difficult, it sounded like that was, could have been fairly recent, too. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, you guys are important to us. And um, we, uh, we don't know where your journey is going to lead, but we hope that you always know that you have a home here. Okay? And uh, we're going to bless them now. So one of our traditions is to raise a hand in blessing, if you would. There's a prayer on the screen, if you will join me in that. Let's pray. Bless these graduates as they now finish high school and look forward to the next stage of their journey. Take away their anxiety and confusion of purpose. Strengthen their many talents and skills. Continue to go before them in love, protection, and provision. We bless them today and all days in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all. stand for the reading of the word. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, 
and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money over and put it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thank you, Haley. Well, good morning again. And uh, uh, after the message, uh, we get to share in the family, in a meal, the family meal of Jesus' people. And of course, we call that Holy Communion. Uh, And I hope everyone picked up your communion elements on the way in, right? And if not, you might just want to slip out or ask an usher to help you. And if you are worshiping online and you wish to receive communion uh, with us this week of May 2nd, then just, you know, you can pause the video if you want and then uh, go and prepare your communion elements. Let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. You alone have the words of eternal life. You came to seek and to save the lost. And today we rejoice in your great salvation. Pour out your presence and power of the Spirit upon us as we receive your word today. In your name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Well, this is week four in our series on craving community, and I believe that the pandemic has heightened that craving. On on Friday at noon... Uh, The weather was so nice that my men's small group, uh, we took off our masks and met outside. (laughs) We hardly recognized each other. (laughs) Experts on small groups will tell you that right after Easter is not the best time of the year to start new groups, but the Holy Spirit was nudging us to give it a try. And I'm so happy to report that in addition to our more than 20 existing groups, we now have a couple more new ones. And I'm in that one on Wednesday nights, and people are getting to know each other and learning together and praying together and building community. Today, we're looking to be in the kind of community where we care for each other's needs. And when we think of being in community, maybe this is the thing that will first come to mind, helping each other. When I was in my early 20s in seminary in Kentucky, a few people back in Nebraska would occasionally write me a note and include a little check in the envelope. And what a a wonderful surprise. I I knew these people believed in me, and they were praying for me, and I used the money to help pay on my tuition. Their letters and prayers and gifts just made me want to double down and study even harder. The scripture that Haley read for us comes from the book of Acts that's called the Acts of the Apostles, and it's the sequel to Luke's gospel about the life of Jesus. And the book of Acts starts with the last words of Jesus before he then uh, leaves earth and goes into the heavens. We call this the Ascension. And we celebrate that every year. It actually kind of comes on the 40th day of the season of Easter, and this year Ascension Day will end up being on May 13th. Ten days after that, in the first century, the the Jewish festival of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus' people. They're gathered in Jerusalem, and that's when they begin to realize that a new day has dawned. The world has changed, and they are living in the age of the Messiah. You and I still live in the age of the Messiah. Jesus is the heaven and earth man, and he has begun his reign over heaven and earth. He has laid claim to it as creation's rightful ruler. And one day, his foes will be vanquished, his reign will be complete, and he will make all things new. That's our confident hope. In the earlier chapters of the book of Acts, all of Jesus' people are still Jews. It's going to 
chapter 10, it'll switch and include Gentiles. But uh, when they're still Jews, most of them are staying in Jerusalem. And thousands of them gather in the temple courtyard every day to hear the apostles tell about Jesus, especially his resurrection. And then what do they do? They break into smaller groups to share meals in each other's homes, and that's where they talk about all the great things God is doing, and then they leave from there and they go out and speak boldly about it all, and and then they gather together again and they pray bold prayers and they take care of each other. Acts 4, uh, verse 32 starts out saying, all the believers were one in heart and mind. The New International Version condenses this a little bit. All the believers could easily be translated the community of believers. The community. And this community of believers was one in heart and mind. And that means they were enjoying tremendous unity. Not necessarily agreeing on everything. I mean, you get two or more together. Does anybody, we all agree, right? But they agree on the essentials. Most of all, they love each other. They're like family to each other. And the rest of verse 32 spells that out then in more practical terms. Uh, It says, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. You know, I read that and I go, wow, they did that? Is that the way Jesus' people are supposed to be? When I lived in Lincoln, we lived in Lincoln, our neighbor uh, was a retired maintenance man. And uh, whenever I needed some tool or equipment or advice, I'd go across the street. Hey, Jess, can I borrow your long reach tree saw? Hey, Jess, do you have a socket that'll fit this? And he always, he always did. I, I admired Jess's garage, it was immaculate and super organized. He had everything, and he loved to help. Uh, One morning, I remember, I I decided that I was going to rebuild the planter next to our front steps because the timbers that were two sides of the planter were starting to lean out, and I was afraid it was going to fall apart. So, um, you know, I started tearing it apart and setting out the work, and and, uh, Jess looked out his window and saw what I was up to, He knew that I was in over my head, as I usually was. So he loaded up his wheelbarrow full of tools and some lengths of pipe that he figured that I was going to need that I didn't know that I was going to need. And he crossed the street to our house, and we worked together on that all day. Got the plan to rebuild. A few years later, Jess and Shirley moved to a retirement apartment, and they had an auction to get rid of a lot of their stuff, and I bought several of those things that I'd been borrowing, (laughs) including that long-reach tree saw, which Trish and I used last night. And she didn't know I was going to talk about this, and she said, good old Jess. (laughs) Let's look again at verse 32, where it says, no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. Notice it doesn't say they turned over all their possessions to the apostles and no longer owned anything. No, that's not what happened. If you had a rental house, you still owned it. If you owned a donkey, it was still yours. If you had a jar of perfume or a silk scarf, it was still yours. But you held these possessions with such an open hand that if someone was in need, you were quick to part with that possession. They figured, hey, possessions aren't going to last anyway. What is going to last is the love that we show people. Of course, that does not give anybody the right to walk into your house and take your silk scarf and say, what is yours is mine. No, it wasn't like that. It's just that they knew in the Messiah's kingdom, they believed that people were more important than possessions. Simple as that. And here's the result. This line comes at the end of verse 33 in the beginning of verse 34. It says this, God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. Don't you love that? And it's the heart of today's message, and it gives us, I think, a beautiful vision of what it means to be Jesus' people. Will you say it with me? 
God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. In this community, no one goes without food, shelter, or warmth. And those who don't have enough always have a friend to help them out. In Bible times, widows uh, were often some of the poorest people. Uh, a couple chapters later in the book of Acts, a complaint arose among Jesus' people that, that a group of these widows was being overlooked in the, in the Meals on Wheels ministry. So the leaders quickly reorganized to make sure no one was left out. Of course, widows weren't the only ones struggling in Judea. The economy was not good. If you were a laborer, some days you could get work and earn a buck, and some days you could not. And those days you and your family may not eat. But Jesus' people were generous, and they took care of each other. Pantry volunteers. I love that we now have six of these raised garden beds to grow fresh vegetables to distribute at our pantry. And these uh, garden beds are a perfect opportunity to switch our thinking from doing for others to doing with others. So I want to challenge you to get our pantry patrons involved in gardening, in the gardens right here on our campus. Get people in the neighborhood involved in the pantry garden. Because if we're just doing for others, we're missing a big opportunity to be doing with others. And I believe it's an opportunity for us to live out every one of our five values. We can be relational, practical, generational, missional, and invitational. And I want you to know that if you call Faith Westwood home, then when you're going through a rough, a rough patch in life, and you need some extra groceries just to see you through until the next payday, you don't have to wait for the two days a month when the pantry's open. Just give us a call. call set an appointment with, with Holly or Vicki or me uh, or maybe somebody else you know who volunteers at the pantry, and, 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 and you can get what you need. We've done it many times before. Remember what our theme verse says. God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. That means when you have a need, you let the community bless you. Let them help you. If God's grace is going to be so powerfully at work in us, that's how it has to be. We have to learn to give and receive. Today's mission focus uh, which we have one every week, uh, is the today's is the Helping Hands Fund. And that fund is one of the ways, just one of the ways, that we help each other. Uh, I want you to know everything's kept confidential, but I want you to also be aware of some of the ways that the Helping Hand Fund gets used. It's been used to help with a rent payment or a utilities payment. It's been used to pay an uncovered medical bill. It's been used to bless a family during the holidays. It's been used to pay for a car repair. It's been used to help someone get started in a few sessions of counseling. Uh, my wife's nephew in Virginia is married to a counselor, and uh, I happened to mention to her one time how at our church we sometimes use our Helping Hands Fund to help people get into counseling. And she was just blown away by that, amazed. She said she wished more churches were willing to help each other with something like that. It's the grace of God working powerfully among us, helping each other in times of need. And you know, it's not always, always with money, is it? I'm a, I'm a big fan of small groups, as you know. And uh, at Faith Westwood, we call them faith groups. Each group is kind of like a mini church. You ever thought of it that way? Long ago, I went to a conference on small groups, 
and the speaker was a pastor from Portland, Oregon, his church had more people in groups every week than they did in worship. And I thought, you know, during the pandemic, that's often been true of us, right? But one story he told really sold me on groups. He said a teenager in his church had uh, died in a car accident, and he went to the family's home to console them. And when he arrived, someone from this boy's parents' small group greeted him at the door. And another from that group offered him coffee. And others were in the kitchen and some were in the living room with the family. The pastor then visited with the parents for a while and stayed a, a good bit. And then he prayed with them. And then one of the small group pastors, excuse me, one of the small group members came up to him and said, you, you don't need to stay, pastor. It's okay. We've got this. <laughs> and he knew that they did. They were the community of Jesus, helping each other in time of need. This family was hurting, but they were not alone. And to me, I think that's what Acts 4 is really pointing to. God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. There, none of them were alone. I see the same thing happening with our meal train ministry. Someone's recovering from surgery or they had a new baby or they're receiving chemo and it means so much to and just get some homemade meals. Help them out. And with meal train, you know, they can specify their dietary restrictions and people can sign up to bring an entire meal or part of a meal and do it on the day that works for them. And so I would just say, if you are ever in a position you need uh, or could benefit, be blessed by a meal train, um, contact Vicki O'Hara, our director of caring ministries. And of course, sometimes we know that a small group will just handle this all on their own. And that's great too. Uh, back in January, my wife Trish had a, a very minor outpatient surgery and someone from her faith group brought us lasagna and salad and breadstick. I think that's probably the most popular meal to give away, don't you? And uh, actually, there were more in the group that offered, but, you know, it was such a quick recovery that she, she declined some of that. But, you know, they just kept checking in on her by text messages. How you doing? And it's not that we would have gone hungry without that one meal, but it was a gift of love. And it meant a lot. We enjoyed that. The, the grace of God is powerfully at work when we give and receive. I mentioned our Helping Hands Fund. We also have a Bless Friends Fund. That was our mission focus last Sunday. We use it to fund ways that we're trying to be a good neighbor to uh, Central Middle School. We use it to pay for improvements uh, for Oaks Park across the street that we've adopted. And uh, it, we use it also to bless individual people who have no church, okay? Faith Westwood wants to, in bless, wants to invest in your blessed friendships. So you can make a request anytime. Uh, the only guidelines that we have for these requests are three things. They live locally, they don't have a church, and you're praying for them. That's it. Your friend needs a car repair, make a request. Your friend needs emergency child care, make a request. Your friend needs airfare to attend a funeral, make a request. I'm trying to be, one of the guys I'm trying to be a blessed friend with uh, is someone who's, who's needing, looking for funding for a community project that he's uh, working on. And so even though I'm on the blessed friend's leadership team, I made a request. Of course, I bowed out of the decision-making. I didn't even suggest an amount. But it did meet the guidelines. He lives, my friend lives locally. He doesn't have a church, and I'm praying for him. And the blessed friend's leadership team said, hey, let's go for it. Let's do it. And I was so excited, I texted my friend right away. My church wants to help in your project. And I believe that he's going to see the grace of God powerfully at work. If you want to make a request, I would encourage you to contact 
Holly Timberlake, our director of adult and family discipleship, and she'll take it to the team. In the book of Acts, there were times when people sold property, a house or a field, to provide for the needs of others. And one who did that uh, in the Bible was Joseph. He's known there in Scripture, though, more by his nickname. Let's look at it. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. And when it says he put it at the apostles' feet, I mean, that could be literal, but I think more it's, it's, it's signifying that he trusted the leadership to decide how to best use it. He relinquished control. He knew his gift was going to help people, and he trusted that they were going to use it wisely. We all have something to give, and we all have something to receive. And when we do that, the grace of God is powerfully at work. It's probably clear by now that I believe that caring for one another is one of the strengths of this church. And yet, I look out, and some of you may be still kind of on the fringes of our faith family. Maybe you haven't yet experienced this, this caring community that I've been talking about. Well, let me encourage you today to take a step toward getting engaged. Maybe try out a small group or serve with our, one of many ministries. We have, there are so many ways you can be a part of that. Build the kind of connections with people. That's what it's really about. Build the kind of connections with people where you naturally take care of one another. And then you too will experience the power of the grace of God. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, thank you for reminding us that possessions are not permanent, but generosity lasts forever. Thank you, God, for your grace that is working so powerfully among us. Lord, help us to not see people in need as victims who can only receive. Give us eyes to see each person's strengths and abilities and what they have to give that maybe we need. And Lord Jesus, we all come to you as receivers. We need only what you can give. You have taken away our sins upon yourself and washed us clean. You have claimed us as your sisters and brothers. And now we claim each other as sisters and brothers. In your name we pray, amen. This morning we have such a privilege to receive communion and, and we believe that, that Christ is present in this moment as we receive the bread and the cup, that his presence is made real to us. And I want you to know that you don't have to be a member of this church or any church to receive communion here. Just come ready to, to turn away from your sins and turn your life over to Christ. We're going to begin our, our prayer before communion with a prayer of confession. Let's, let's pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. Because of the grace you have shown through your Son, Jesus, have mercy on us and forgive us. Give us the grace to delight in your will and walk in your ways. 
And now let me give you a moment to bring your own personal confessions before God. Hear these words of assurance. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And now let us join as God's forgiven people in the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, it is always a good and joyful thing everywhere, at every time, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty. You are the creator of heaven and earth. And when we turned away from you, and when our love failed, your love remained steadfast. Lord Jesus, on the night in which you gave yourself up for us, you took the bread and you blessed it and broke it and you gave it to your disciples and said take and eat this is my body given for you and then you took the cup and you gave thanks and you gave it to them saying this is my blood poured out for you for a new covenant and every time you drink of it remember me So, Heavenly Father, we ask that you will pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered here and upon these gifts of bread and the fruit of the vine that they may be for us and bring to us the very presence of Christ. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And now let's join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now if you'll open your little tub there. Receive the bread, the body of Christ given for you. Amen. And then with the cup, if you'll peel back the side where the, where the juice is, it doesn't have to come all the way off. the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Now let's stand as we sing.
Well, do you remember what the uh, mission focus is? Helping Hands Fund, that's right. So if you want to participate, there are envelopes in the pew there, and you can do that. There are ways you can do that online as well. And, of course, uh, we encourage you to, to give to our 2021 ministry fund. That is the fund that makes pretty much everything happen at Faith Westwood. And there are buckets out on stools as you leave the worship center. You can put your cards in there and these envelopes and any other offering that you have. All right, now... I'd like to have these two guys come on up and uh, stand up here and be greeted. Will you do that after? Maybe on that little spot where you were before, right up there. There you go. And then uh, I would encourage you to just to come up and, and give them a six-foot high five or six-foot fist bump or wave or whatever you want to do. But we'll keep it safe and, and do all that, all right? And uh, Polly, did you... No, never mind. Okay. Uh, in seven days, we're going to be back here again. We're going to be worshiping the Lord. I hope you can join us, and I invite you to take this worship into the coming week. And remember that we are sisters and brothers of Jesus. We are made family by him, and we take care of each other, right? Will you join with me as we say, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.